This is the Crossroads Institute. Tonight, we are in the book of James. Uh, Pastor Scott Overby will be taking us through our journey. So get your Bibles out, and here we go. All right, well, hello, Crossroads. Pastor Scott here. Welcome to the Crossroads Institute once again. Uh, as we go through the books of the New Testament, uh, what an exciting study it's been so far, and I hope to uh, I hope today is no different. And so let me just go ahead. Let's just jump right on in. Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me uh, to what many have called the least theological book in all of the New Testament. And I'm, of course, speaking of the New Testament book of Jacob. That's right. You heard me right. The New Testament book of Jacob. And you say, wait a minute, Pastor Scott. Now, I, I've read the Bible a couple of times. I don't remember any book of Jacob in the New Testament. Well, okay, of course, you may know it by its English name, and that is the book of James. And while in some people's mind, listen, this, this book may be the least theological book in the entire New Testament. Others might say it's the book of Philemon. But nevertheless, everybody to a man agrees that this book, the book of James, it is the most practical book in all of the New Testament. Now, of course, you know there are 27 books in the New Testament canon, and James uh, is number 20 of the 27. Now, I want you to think about this with me just for a minute. Uh, the, the, there are uh, uh, 21 of the 27 New Testament books. Again, 27 New Testament books, 21 of them, or 77.77% of the 27 books of the New Testament are classified as what we call epistles. Of course, that word epistle is a Greek word. We basically transliterate it or import it directly into our English language, directly from the Greek. And this word epistle, it's a Greek word that literally means Means letter. And so 21 of the 27 books, 77.777% uh, of these books are epistles. 77% of the New Testament are epistles. And, and here's how these epistles uh, break down or stack up, however you want to think about it. 13 of the 21 New Testament epistles are Pauline epistles. One of the epistles is the epistle to the Hebrews. And then you've got seven of what we call the general epistles. And, and so that's a total, 13 plus 1 plus 7, that's, that's 21 total epistles. Now, let's continue to think along these lines with me. I hope you find this interesting, but uh, I, I did when I started thinking through it. But there are 27 books, again, in the New Testament. And if we think in terms of literary classifications of these 27 books, it breaks down like this. There are four of the 27 books is what we call or we classify in the uh, literary genre of Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course. One of the books is a what we would call a history book. Book. That's the book of Acts. And then you have, again, these 21 epistles, these 21 uh, epistolatory books or letters. And then you've got one book of prophecy. Of course, that's the book of Revelation for a total of 27 books, four gospels, one history, 21 epistles, and one book of prophecy. So there are four literary genres, really, if you will, within the New Testament. But the dominant New Testament literary genre, I mean, the overwhelmingly dominant genre is that of the epistle or the epistolatory uh, genre, the letter, in other words. 77.77% of the total volume of the New Testament. Well, again, when it comes to these 21 New Testament epistles, 13 of them, as we've already said, are what we call Pauline epistles. Uh, he, he writes the predominant, you know, the, the yeoman share of all of the 21, 13 of the 21 epistles. That's why I like to call him, you know, sometimes instead of the Apostle Paul, I like to call him the Epistle Paul, because he, he loves to write letters. And uh, so 13 of them are Pauline epistles. One of them is Hebrews. We don't even know who the author of that book is. And then we have these seven uh, uh, 
epistles remaining, and these seven are what we refer to, what Bible scholars refer to as the general epistles, and there are seven of them. And these seven general epistles, they are nestled right in there, right in the shadow of the mighty epistle uh, to the Hebrews. And these seven epistles are as follows. It's James, first and second Peter, first, second, and third John, and Jude, for a total of seven general epistles. And we call these seven epistles the general epistles, or uh, sometimes referred to as the Catholic epistles, due to the fact that they are not addressed to any specific locality or any specific audience necessarily. And so when it comes to the general epistles, something else you need to keep in mind is the book of James of the seven general epistles. It's the book of James that uh, Bible you know, scholars and teachers, they often refer to James as the chief of the general epistles. And they call it the chief or refer to it as the chief because it is the, the largest uh, of the general epistles. And it's also the first uh, of the general epistles to be written. And so they call it or refer to it as the chief of the general epistles. Now, it's interesting to me that we can easily overlook these seven general epistles, but we shouldn't do that. We, we don't want to do that. And I want to point out something to you about these uh, general epistles. Now, I've got a little bit of a, a diagram here, a little bit of uh, whatever you want to call it, a, a, a a helper here, but look at these seven general epistles with me, and something needs to jump out at us, and what we have here uh, is that uh, as you look at these names closely on this list, uh, the, the three main pillars or the three main personalities, if you will, of the early church are found right here in these seven general epistles, and I've circled the three of them for you. And listen, this is not just my assessment. This is not just me saying this, but rather this is based on what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9. You'll remember Paul and Barnabas and Titus uh, they go to Jerusalem to meet with the uh, leaders of the church there and to get their blessing as they would be taking the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. And Paul says this, he says, in recognizing the grace that had been given to me, and here it is, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars uh, they were known to be or recognized to be pillars of the early church. He says, they gave to me and the Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go uh, to the Gentiles. And so right there you have these three main pillars of the early church all right here included within the seven books of the uh, general epistles, James, Peter, and John. So hopefully that gives you some motivation to, to zero in on these seven general epistles and not just overlook them uh, as you read the New Testament. Let me give you some facts on the book of James as we begin to think about it together. Uh, the book of James, it's rather short. It's just five chapters, 108 verses long. And again, as we've said, it's the chief or known as the chief of the, of the general epistles because it's the largest of the seven general epistles. First John comes in a very close close second with 105 verses, just three verses uh, shorter than James. And, and while this book, the book of James, uh, it, it, uh, it's in the New Testament, yes, but as you read it, and as we're going to see here in this study, the book of James nevertheless has a very distinct Old Testament flavor or Old Testament feel to it. In fact, within the 108 verses of the book of James, there are references or allusions to 22 of the 39 Old Testament books. So the book of James is just saturated with the Old Testament. Uh, in addition to this, not only is it an Old Testament uh, uh, flavored book or a feel of a book, it's also a um, uh, teachings of Christ is, is very evident within the book of James. In fact, scholars have identified as many as 15 allusions to the teachings of Jesus, and most all of them here in the book of James are kind of referenced from the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll talk more about this later, but very interesting, a very 
heavy Old Testament flavor, a very uh, heavy influence from the teachings of Jesus, especially from uh, the greatest sermon that he ever preached, that being the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I like to refer to James as a bossy book. That's not that's not very uh, you know erudite, but it's a bossy book. And what I mean by that is there are sixty uh, imperatives within the book of James. Imperative being that Greek verb tense that indicates a direct command or indicates a very authoritative uh, tone to it. Sixty times a verb is in the uh, imperative tense. In this book, there's five chapters. You divide, you know, uh, 60 imperatives by five chapters. That's an average of 12 uh, imperatives per per chapter or one command for about every uh, two verses uh, in this book. Imperatives, again, are meant to be uh, used for exhortation. They are meant to drive application in the life of the reader. And so James, with all of these 60 imperatives, James becomes a becomes very much it becomes very much a do this kind of book okay uh, bible scholars point out that this authoritative tone that dominates the book of james indicates to the reader that the author is someone of unusual gravitas or stature within uh, the community of that early first century church. And the use of all these 60 imperatives demonstrates as well, in addition, James, the author, it, it demonstrates his passionate feeling about the issues that his readers were facing and as he addresses these issues in this book. Not only is it a bossy book, though, it's an inaugural book. James is the first book of the New Testament to be written chronologically, dating back all the way to the year 46 AD. It's the first New Testament book. It's number 20 in our list of books in the New Testament, but literally, chronologically, it was the first one written. It's a controversial book. The canonicity of this book uh, was highly debated over the centuries. Uh, there were questions about the authorship of this book. Who is this James? Uh, we can't quite figure it out. Or when was this book really written? What was the date of its authorship? There's also problems with its unity. I mean, James is so multifaceted, so many different subjects. There, it's really hard to outline it. Uh, it was uh, also looked down upon because of its size. It's relatively short, just five chapters. And also, again, as I said earlier in my introduction, it's the least theological book when you just on the a surfacey reading of it. And so uh, a lot of uh, early church fathers didn't really believe James should be included within the New Testament canon. And it was not until the 4th or 5th century A.D., that James finally became widely accepted and was uh, included on a regular basis within the 27 books of the New Testament uh, canon. Uh, it's also controversial because uh, the great reformer, Martin Luther, was not a big fan at all uh, when it came to the book of James. Luther famously referred to James as a right strawy epistle, uh, which was basically Luther's way of saying that uh, James is a lightweight book uh, when it comes to theological truth and doctrine. And I, you know, there's a sense in which I would I would agree with Luther's assessment, but I would say it a little bit different. I would say the book of James is indeed a strawy epistle, yes, but it's strawy in the sense that it's sticky, it's it's prickly, uh, it, it pokes you. It's it's got one commentator says it's got enough needles in this haystack of James to prick the conscience of every dull, defeated, and degenerate Christian in the world. And I would just say amen to that. The book of James is a sweeping book. And what I mean by this is that, as I said earlier, James covers a myriad of different topics. James talks about trials. He talks about temptation. He talks about wisdom and favoritism and faith and uh, the tongue and teachers and strife within the church. He talks about humility and planning for the future and patience and prayer and the, the contemptuous treatment of the poor, uh, just a wide variety of topics. And this is why the book of James is the favorite New Testament book of so many uh, Christians around the world. It's because it is so multifaceted and it speaks to so many diverse 
subjects. New Testament scholar E.J. Goodspeed described James as follows. He said, James is just a handful of pearls dropped one by one into the hearer's mind. I like that. Uh, James is a practical book. James has been called the New Testament book of Proverbs because of its intense practicality. Uh, This book covers all the same issues that we face in church life uh, today. The the book is intensely practical. I mean, think about it. Do you struggle with playing favorites? Who doesn't? Do you struggle with being a respecter of persons? We all can have that tendency from time to time. Do you have do you struggle controlling your tongue? Well, certainly. Who doesn't? Do you do you struggle uh, with trials and how to know how to endure through a trial? How to make sense of a trial? Well, these are just some of the very practical issues that James addresses uh, in this uh, very very practical book. James is also an uh, an illustrative book. James is filled with all kinds of stories and figures and images and metaphors and similes and rhetorical questions. It's also a nature book. There are 30 references in five chapters uh, to nature, more than in all of Paul's epistles combined. So just in this one epistle, Uh, Compared to 13 of the Pauline epistles, you've got more references to nature. Now, let me ask you something. Where do you think James got the idea to use nature uh, in order to teach biblical truth? Well, I would just submit to you, he got it from his half-brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. James uses the everyday things people were familiar with day-to-day to to help explain uh, the spiritual things that they were unfamiliar with. And so, James is an illustrative book. James is a nature book. This letter of James has been called by many a chain letter, Uh, again, because it's not written to one specific congregation uh, in particular uh, at all. Notice, in fact, James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. And so James, because it's not written to one specific locale, was most likely a chain letter, what we call technically an encyclical. It's written to the 12 tribes, which is a reference to ethnic Jews, obviously, who because of severe persecution that had broken out there in the first century, these Jews had been dispersed out of Jerusalem, out of Uh, Judea, and so no doubt this letter was intended to be circulated and passed around wherever these uh, groups or pockets of of these Jewish uh, 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 people had been dispersed in these other cities uh, near and far. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the author of this book. Uh, And again, we played around with a little bit of the name of this book. The author of this book is Jacob, literally, uh, Yaakov in the the, uh, Hebrew language. Uh, The word Yaakov or the name Yaakov means to be behind or to supplant. Literally, it means to seize the heel right? Uh, The supplanter, that's what Jacob is, uh, the heel grabber. And uh, that's who he was in the Old Testament. And so James really is a Hellenized or a Greek Greek, Greekized version of the Hebrew name Yaakov or, or Jacob. And there's an interesting etymology when you trace it back, the word, the Hebrew name Jacob, and how we got to James from that. But it goes from the Hebrew to the Greek to the uh, Latin to the European and finally to the English. And so there's this long uh, trail uh, etymologically of how this name kind of morphed and evolved uh, through that process. But we don't need to spend much time on that. But let me just remind you about the story of Jacob from the Old Testament. I think you'll find this interesting. Genesis 25 verses 19 through 26. Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac. That's Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, uh, to be his wife. Um, uh, She was the sister of Laban, the Aramean, uh, and Isaac prayed to the Lord. He prays to Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. And the Lord answered him, and, and his wife, Rebekah, uh, was able to conceive. But the children struggled within her, 
And she said, if it is so, why am I in this condition? And so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two people will be separated from your body, and one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And when her days leading to the delivery were at at an end, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. That literally means hairy, okay? And, And then after his brother came out, now here it is, with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. And so they named this second twin Jacob or Yaakov, and uh, Isaac was 60 years old when she, uh, when Rebekah gave birth to the twins. Well, that's the Old Testament Jacob. Uh, you remember the story well. Yaakov, Israel's third great patriarch, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But who is this Jacob in the New Testament? Who is this James, rather? Well, listen, there are four men in the New Testament bearing the name of James. And really, only two of these men were significant enough or prominent enough to have ever been proposed as being the author of this letter. And the two are, number one, the Apostle James. That is the You remember the Apostle James, the brother of the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, They were brothers. They were known as the sons of Zebedee. That's one of the Jameses that is always included as a potential author of this book. The other is James, the half-brother of our Lord. Uh, But there are four of these Jameses, nevertheless, sprinkled through the pages of the New Testament. So let's do a quick biblical theology of these four men named James. Number one is uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, a.k.a. James the Less. We, we find him recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. And he's one of the original 12 apostles and disciples. But other than that, he is, I mean, hardly ever heard of again. He's just a little-known character in the New Testament. So we can kind of Uh, say he's probably not the author. Then there's this person named James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. Remember, Judas, not Iscariot, was also one of the 12. Well, his father was named James. Uh, uh, And he's another one of these obscure characters, only mentioned in Luke 6, verse 16. And so we can kind of slide him off as uh, probably not a contender uh, to be the author of this book either. Then, of course, there's, as we've mentioned, James the son of Zebedee, James the apostle, uh, James the brother of John, James who was martyred in 44 A.D., James the most frequently mentioned James in the Gospels. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, one of the sons of thunder, this rough and tumble Galilean fisherman called to be a disciple in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. He's the first of the disciples to give his life for the gospel. That's recorded in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Part of this, that was all part of the persecution that I mentioned earlier that had broken out there in and around Jerusalem. The Bible says Herod Agrippa the first. Uh, Agrippa I was the grandson of Herod the Great. He puts James to death by the sword, the Bible says there in Acts 12, verse 2. And of course, this James, he's an excellent candidate to be the author of this book, except for one major problem, and that is that most Bible scholars feel that he dies, he's martyred, uh, you know, uh, way too early to have written and been the author of this book. And so we can kind of look at him closely, but he's not quite going to measure up. And that leaves us with James, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, And he uh, is the one that we kind of zero in on. He was the leader, if you'll remember, the recognized leader of the church there in Jerusalem. In fact, in Galatians 1.19, the apostle Paul refers to James as James, the Lord's brother, quote, unquote. And it's interesting Scholars, when they talk about this James, they often refer to James as the uterine brother of Jesus and the son of Mary and Joseph. In other words, they they were uterine brothers, uh, half-brothers, yes, but uterine brothers nevertheless. And of course, here in a couple of weeks, I guess, when we continue through our book-by-book study of the New Testament, we're going to find ourselves here 
in the uh, Institute in the book of Jude. And of course, Jude is, is also a half-brother of Jesus, and therefore, he's also a uterine brother, if you will, of our Lord. So we have these two uterine brothers of our Lord who write books in the New Testament. A little bit of trivia there for you. But this James, the half-brother of Jesus, he's also known as the first pastor of of Christianity. Now, let me say that again. He's known as the first pastor of Christianity. And that's, when you start thinking about that, that is absolutely profound. And as you'll recall, James was, he was not even a believer until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember John chapter 7, verses 2 through 8. Let me read this. Now, the feast of the Jews, the feast of booze, that's the feast of tabernacles, was near. And so his brothers, Jesus' brothers rather, said to him, move on from here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For one does not do anything in secret when he himself is striving to be known publicly. If you're doing all these things and you really are, in other words, the Messiah, go show yourself to the world. And here it is, verse 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. And then, of course, you know, the resurrected Christ makes this special appearance. I mean, the resurrected Christ goes out of his way, it seems, to make a special in-person appearance to James. Paul chronicles this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Paul says, And after this, Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And here it is, verse 7. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And of course, last of all, Paul says, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And so James is what we would call really a late bloomer, right? I mean, he becomes a believer in Jesus, his own half-brother, his uterine brother. He begins to believe in Christ as the Messiah only after the resurrection. And so, yes, he's a late bloomer, but he's also a fast riser because immediately following, it seems, his conversion, James subsequently uh, becomes the first pastor of the church, of the first church right there in Jerusalem. And he pastors this church during a very, very difficult time. He pastors from approximately 33 AD until he is martyred. He is stoned to death by the orders of the high priest right there in Jerusalem in AD 62, probably when he was between the ages of 55 and and 65. And now, this bears repeating because James was the pastor of, think about this, he was the pastor of the the mother church there in Jerusalem. I mean, that's saying something. All other subsequent churches sprang from this one singular church back there in 33 A.D. in Jerusalem. And so, it is James, the half-brother of Jesus, I believe, who writes this letter, and as I've already said, this is the first book uh, written in the New Testament, probably written around 46 A.D. And this is an amazing thing. As you read the book of James, and don't miss this, we are reading, when you think about it, we are reading the very first words of the New Testament. It's like in the Old Testament, in the beginning God, you know, Genesis 1-1 or something. But James is the very first words of the New Testament. This is Christianity in its earliest and most primitive form. Obviously, we can understand why the Gospels appear first in book order in the New Testament, but, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, because this makes perfect sense because obviously Jesus is the main character and all of that. But as far as the chronological order of the New Testament is concerned, James is the first book to be written. You know, it's funny, you know, we we always talk about how we want to go back and be just like the early church. Well, listen, you want to know what the early church was like? Well, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, right here. This is the church in the first century in its earliest form, its most embryonic form, right here in the book of James. Nothing else church-wise predates what you read in the book of James. Think about it. The first Christian pastor, James, of the first Christian church in Jerusalem. He writes the first New Testament book, the book of James, chronologically. And he's one of the first martyrs 
in the Christian faith. Now, many have asked the question, they, they look at this book and they say, wait a minute, you know, they're looking at the opening verses of this book and they say, why, this is crazy, why doesn't James introduce himself as the half-brother of Jesus? I mean, why didn't he just come out and say it? Why doesn't he at least call himself the son of Mary? Or, or hey, I'm James, the witness of the resurrected Christ. Or, hey, I'm James, I was present on the day of Pentecost. I'm James, I'm the chief elder of the church in Jerusalem from its very inception. Or, hey, I'm James, the guy that presided over the apostolic conference there in Acts chapter 15. I'm James, the brother of God. Listen to what I'm saying. It, 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 he doesn't say any of those things, and I think it's because this James, he didn't really need any introduction whatsoever. Uh, everyone knew who James was. He's kind of like one of these Brazilian soccer players. You, you just throw out their names, and people know them. They don't have a last name or a middle name. It's just a singular name, and uh, they knew who this guy was. There was no doubt about it. They knew who James was. He was the recognized leader of the church in Jerusalem. He could simply introduce himself as James without everyone saying, James who? They didn't need to say that. And let me make this point as well. Think about this. No doubt James had previously regarded Jesus as his physical brother, his, his uterine brother, if you will. But it's apparent as you read this letter that Jesus became so much more to James than that. So much so that he just basically <laughs> forgot all about that. The physical relationship seems now to recede into the background. And while others in the early church might have referred to James as the Lord's brother, certainly, he rather preferred to speak of himself as James, a bondservant, a doulos, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. James 1.1, 1, 1. James, a bondservant, a doulos of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This reminds me exactly of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.16, though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him so no more. There's just this disappearance or evaporation of this earthly relationship that was so very real, but after the resurrection, following the advent of the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus Christ in this new spiritual union, all of that other physical stuff goes by the wayside for a higher, a more meaningful relationship. Another way Bible scholars pinpoint James, the half-brother of Jesus, as being the, the author of this letter is that they painstakingly <laughs> compare the Greek text uh, found here in the epistle of James with the speech of James recorded for us in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. That all went down in A.D. 49. And listen, of the 230 words of James's speech there in Acts 15, and also of this subsequent letter that's recorded there as well in Acts 15, so many of the same exact words occur in both instances, and again in the in the apostle or the epistle of James, and yet they appear nowhere else in the New Testament. Are you following me? Of the 230 words of James's speech and his letter that's recorded in Acts 15, many of the words there are also found in the epistle of James, but nowhere else. And so it would seem that it came from the exact same pen, uh, one and the other. And so the preponderance of evidence seems to be overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly pointing to James, the half-brother of Jesus, as the author of this book. Now, I went a long way into that, but again, it was a it's been a controversial question over the centuries. Who is this James, this Yakov, who, who writes this epistle? Now, let me, I, I love to look back in history as well and look at these characters, these authors of these books. And James in church history is, is absolutely interesting, to me anyway. Hegesippus, an early Jewish convert to Christianity. Hegesippus, a, a writer, a chronicler, a historian, writing uh, all the way back in 170, 165 A.D. He is quoted uh, describing James 
This same James we're talking about here, he describes him, quote, as a Nazarite who drank no wine or strong drink and who ate no animal food and whose head was not touched by a razor. Now, apparently he's referring to James who must have, if this is all true, must have taken some sort of a Nazarite vow. Isn't that interesting? Now, this is uh, ancient history. We don't know if this is true or, or verified, but it, it's it's interesting nevertheless. Then you look over in Josephus's writings. Josephus also had a little bit to to add on to uh, our understanding of this James, especially related to his death. Josephus, writing in his magnum opus, The Antiquity of the Jews, says this, He says, upon the death of the procurator Festus and before his ascension, Albinus had arrived in A.D. 62. Now, remember that date, A.D. 62. Then the newly appointed young high priest, Ananus II, who assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and and brought before them, notice, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. In some others he brought also, when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. We go back now to Hegesippus, writing in the second century, and he adds to this story. He says that James was known as James the Just, speaking of his uh, personal holiness and piety, and that James the Just, he says, spent much of his time in the temple praying, so much so, in fact, that his knees became as hard as camels. And so he was referred to as old camel knees. Now, no one wants to be called that, but uh, man, uh, he must have been an amazing man of prayer. And he goes on, Hegesippus, to say this, and when James publicly refused to repudiate the claims of Jesus as the Messiah. He would not deny Christ, in other words. The infuriated priest forced him to the temple rooftop. Now, this ought to get our attention. The temple rooftop, ironically, the exact same place that Jesus, remember, in Luke chapter 4, was tempted by Satan himself. And they took him to the rooftop And they didn't tempt him. They just threw him off. They threw him over. And since he was not killed, Hegesippus said, they they then went down to where he was and beat him to death with clubs. And so that potentially was how James's life ended there in 62 AD. So that's the author of this book. What an amazing character uh, James was, the uterine brother of our Lord, the first pastor of the first church. Uh, We could go on. What an absolute amazing resume this guy's got. But let's talk now about the audience of this book. Um, And uh, you'll notice, uh, goodness, uh, obviously from James chapter 1, verse 1, you know, I, James, a bondservant of God and of, of Christ, notice, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And so the audience, the recipients, it's quite obvious here in verse 1, uh, the audience of this book are the 12 tribes. I love that word, 12, or that phrase, 12 tribes. It's the it's the dodeca uh, phules, dodeca. Do means two, deca means 10, the two and 10, the 12 tribes. Tribes is phules. It means it's the word uh, for clans or tribes. Uh, and so the, the, the two and 12 tribes. And so ethnically, we know who the 12 tribes are. Uh, the audience is Jewish, right? Uh, that's patently obvious. But yes, they're Jewish, but uh, ethnically, but they are spiritually, they're Christians, they're believers, they're Jewish Christians. And think about this. This was the Jewish, or uh, to be a Jewish, or to be a Jew, or to be an Israelite, that was the predominant demographic of the early church, right? Uh, I mean, Jesus was Jewish. The 12 disciples were Jewish. Jerusalem was the Jewish capital of Israel. Uh, James, uh, the writer of this book, the, the pastor of the first church was Jewish. All the early converts to Christianity were predominantly, you know, 99% Jewish. And so when it comes to James's audience, These are Jewish Christians, and James refers to them as brethren, my beloved brethren, over and over again in this letter. Uh, In fact, eight times he uses the term or the phrase, my brethren, eight more times the phrase, my beloved brethren. And so James loved these people. And of course, anyone who's going to be successful in any ministry endeavor must love and care 
uh, for God's people. Now, it's a beautiful thing in this book, James, and and most people don't even pick up on this, but as we've said, the Hebrew equivalent to the name James is the Hebrew name Yaakov or Jacob. And so here, follow me now, this is very interesting. So here in the very first book of the New Testament is James, a bondservant of God, or literally Jacob, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes. So what you have here, when you think about it, you've got James, this ba- this this New Testament Jacob, if you will. And remember the Old Testament Jacob, who would later be named what? He would na- later be named Israel. And then he had uh, some, some sons, right? How many sons did he have? He had 12 sons who became the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have this New Testament Jacob writing to the 12 clans, the 12 uh, fules, the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. And so there's this beautiful connection Uh, kind of almost hidden here, if you will, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, this beautiful imagery that I didn't want you to miss. So again, ethnically, the audience is Jewish, but spiritually, they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the message and the content of this letter makes this abundantly clear. Now, most Bible scholars believe that many, if not most, of the recipients of this letter they, they, they most likely were actually once members of James's congregation there in the church in Jerusalem. And because of all this Jewishness that you have in and around that church and in and around uh, uh, Jerusalem there, as you might imagine, this letter then, as we've already mentioned earlier, takes on an unmistakable Jewish tone or flavor or feel, maybe more so than any other book. Uh, in the New Testament canon, because it's being written to a Jewish constituency uh, by a Jew himself. There are there are distinctly Jewish references, salt and peppered all through uh, this letter. Uh, the 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 word synagogue is used in James two two. Abraham is referenced in chapter two verse twenty one. Gehenna is referenced in chapter three verse six. The early and latter rain, a, a Jewish Old Testament concept in chapter five verse four. Reference to God as the Lord Almighty. It's an Old Testament name for God that's never used anywhere else in the New Testament. Yahweh Sabaoth, the the God of angelic armies, the the Lord of hosts, in other words, uh, occurs there in James chapter 5, verse 4. Distinctly Jewish, distinctly Hebrew Old Testament. There's the mention of Rahab, Job, Elijah, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments, allusions again to 22 of the 39 books of the Old Testament. And so as James writes, he writes as a pastor in abstentia to these scattered Jewish Christians no longer who, who no longer have any contact with the apostles there in Jerusalem, nor with the church in Jerusalem, nor with James for, for instruction and exhortation and encouragement and guidance and counsel. Now, economically, when it comes to this audience, most of them, as you might imagine, If they've been dispersed, they are no doubt, most of them, very, very poor and downtrodden. And and you see that all the way through this book. But there are a few of these believers that are rich. And of course, back during this time, there really was no middle class. You you were either rich or poor. There was no in-between. It was the haves and the have-nots. And you'll notice that James refers to them geographically as dispersed abroad, to to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And I love this Greek phrase here. It's that Greek phrase, in diaspora. In diaspora. Dia means across or through or throughout. And uh, spora means seed. And so it's the idea of, they were just like, you know, seed that was being sown out all over uh, that geographical area. They were dispersed. They're in diaspora. And so what's going on here is James is the pastor of this church in Jerusalem, but in the early church there in Jerusalem in the first century, uh, you have this deadly wave, if you will, of persecution that erupts 
uh, severely. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, even as the church itself is being born right then, it's being birthed essentially, and this persecution breaks out. And of course, ironically, much of this persecution is being uh, uh, fueled and led by one Saul of Tarsus, okay? Isn't that interesting? We see this, you know, uh, exhibit A is with Stephen. When Stephen is stoned, uh, they're stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And so that's the backdrop of this book of James, this severe persecution led by Saul and others erupting in, in and around Jerusalem. People are being ravaged. They're being driven out. Notice what it says in chapter Acts 7, 7, verse 58. When they had driven him, Stephen, out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. Then the very next chapter, chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, and on that day, it says, a great, a mega persecution began against the church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly. It began there in Jerusalem, and the Christians, they were all scattered yeah, uh, that's that same word, uh, diaspora, again, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem, and some devout men buried Stephen, mourned loudly for him. But Saul, it says, began ravaging the church. That word ravaging means to injure, to, to ruin, uh, to treat shamefully, to, to devastate. He began ravaging this church, entering house after house. He would drag away men and women and put them in prison. So the deal was, listen, listen, if you don't, if you stay, you're going to get thrown in jail. If you, if you leave, you can escape possibly. And so these people were dispersed all over. And if that were not enough, uh, more persecution began to break out as well as Herod Agrippa I, who I mentioned earlier, has James the apostle, James the son of Zebedee, brother of John, put to death in Acts chapter 12. And so in Acts chapter 7 through 12, there's this massive, severe persecution breaking out in and around Jerusalem. Satan, I believe, basically attempting to snuff out the early church before it can even uh, get up on its feet and get going. And so as you might imagine, because of all this, what happened is, is that many of the believers from, from the church in Jerusalem, from James's church that he was pastoring there, they begin to flee and go up north. They flee to, up into Syria, into Antioch, Phoenicia, even the island of Cyprus, the Bible says, uh, the area that we would call Lebanon and so forth. And, and so now James is writing this letter to these people, these scattered church members, his flock, his sheep, if you will. He's writing to help them deal with some of the very real issues uh, that are facing them as they have been dispersed uh, abroad. And so um, <clears throat> uh, I could go on about this, but here are some of the things they were struggling with. They were struggling with trials on the outside. They were struggling with temptation on the inside. Uh, they were struggling, it seems, that some of the believers were catering to the rich, probably trying to curry favor because they had left everything behind. Uh, some of them were being taken advantage of by the rich people. Uh, many of the believers were failing to practice what they uh, professed. They, they had faith without works. There was competition to be teachers in the church. The tongue was a problem. Uh, of course, yeah, I mean, the tongue's not necessarily the problem. Sin's the problem, but they had trouble controlling their tongue. Selfish desires seemed to be rampant. Worldliness causing division even within these assemblies as they would try to regather in these foreign places. Uh, some of the people were arrogant and presumptuous, and the list just goes on and on and on. And of course, these are basically the exact same problems that, that beset the church today as well, right? I mean, everyone seems to be, you know, enamored, as they say, with the early church. But as you look at this book of James, I mean, here it is. I mean, kind of in living color. It's no different, really, than today. People are people in every, uh, seems like in every dispensation, same problems seem to emerge time and time again. The purpose, of, the purpose of the book of James, the book of James is concerned with bringing the reader to spiritual maturity. It focuses on, again, these very practical aspects of the Christian life and Christian conduct and explains how faith works, how faith works. This letter is a call for us to put our faith into action, to put it to, 
put it to work. And for our faith to be real, it needs to be evident in our everyday life. It's, it's all about a belief that behaves. James writes as a pastor to a scattered flock uh, to exhort them to Christian maturity, to exhort them to live out their belief in their everyday behavior, even during very trying times. Well, let's get into this book real quick. I, I want to just kind of skip a rock over it. But um, chapter one, let's just talk about this for a second. Now, one of the things about the book of James, uh, one of the first things you notice as you begin to read it is that James's writing style, he is very concise. His sentences are short and crisp and simple, and they're compact and very direct. James is forceful and blunt. Maybe you would even say curt. He speaks really more like an Old Testament prophet. Uh, in fact, one commentator says James's brief pointed sentences are like piercing arrows that invariably hit the mark. Now, I want to show this to you. This becomes very evident. Notice how the book starts, James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a bondservant of, the, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the author, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings, that's the audience and the greeting, uh, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. That's the first topic he wants to uh, deliver. Now, if you're used to reading Paul's writings and his letters, or Peter's even, those guys, they usually have a very long on-ramp into their letter, you know, a very long salutation at the beginning, but not James. He briefly introduces himself, bang, and then he briefly uh, identifies his audience, bang, and then he immediately just jumps right in, launches right in to his first topic, bang bang, 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 and it's that way through the whole book. It just goes, 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 staccato style. Then we turn over to the end of James, and everything in between is the same, but the end is no different. I want you to notice this with me as well. Uh, the last two verses, chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, he goes, My brothers and sisters, if any anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who has turned a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins, period, hard stop. That's it. I mean, wow. There's no, there's no ending salutation. There's no benediction. There's no gentle glide path here at the end of this book. James just ends it. He wraps it up unceremoniously, suddenly, almost abruptly, right here in verse 20. Thank you very much. It's over. It's almost like, you know, where's the, re am I, you know, where's the next page? Where's the next chapter? Reminds me of that old show, you know, back in the day, Dragnet and Sergeant Friday, you know, his famous quote, you know, every show, uh, just the facts, ma'am, you know, just the facts. And so I wanted you to be aware of James's style. It's very unique uh, to him, and it stands out uh, among the other books of the New Testament in a very uh, interesting way. Now, let's go back to the opening verses of this chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 2, James says, Notice, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Now, it's fascinating again, as I said earlier, these are the very first words, think about this, of the New Testament. And so the very first topic that's discussed in the entire New Testament is what? Well, it's right there. It's the trials of life, right? Now, this is most interesting to me because, as we've said, again, James being the first New Testament book written, 46 A.D., but rewind the tape a little bit. What was the first book written in the Old Testament? What was it? Well, most people think Job, right? Job was the first book chronologically written in the Old Testament. And uh, let me ask you a question. What's Job about? What's the topic? What's, it's why do the righteous suffer? It's about suffering and struggling and trials and troubles in life. Job experienced more than his share, certainly. And it's interesting that Job is actually even mentioned <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, in the book of James. He, James refers to the patience of Job in chapter 5, verse 11. So my point is this. The first book of the Old Testament, Job. Emphasis, trials. The first book of the New Testament, James. Emphasis, trials. 
And I think what this tells us is, I love this, it tells us, it shows us, it proves to us that God knows exactly what great questions man is going to ask. He knows exactly what our needs are and and what we need to have information about. And God does not shy away for one instant from the great question of why do the righteous suffer? Uh, Rather, right in the very first book of the Old Testament, Job, and right in the very first book of the New Testament, James, God just takes it head on. He takes these ultimate questions of righteousness and suffering head on. Uh, right there at the ver- very beginning, I find that most, most fascinating. James 1.1, 1, 1, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Now, a couple of points to note about this that I want you to see. James says, consider it all joys, my brothers, when you encounter trials. Now, notice here, it doesn't. James does not say if you encounter trials. Uh, rather, he says when you encounter various trials. In other words, it's a given. Take it to the bank. Brace yourself. You're going to encounter various trials. He doesn't say if. He says when. And so that could not be any more clear. And this word trials, it's, uh, we'll talk more about it in a minute, but it's the Greek word parasmos. It, it's a trial, yes, but it's really a test. It's like an experiment to see how much a person can uh, hold up under. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Very interesting word, parasmos. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical to understand that here in this passage. This word encounter here, when you encounter various trials, it's the Greek word uh, peripasete, and in the Greek literally means to fall into or to fall around, and that's the way trials are, right? We don't go planning trials into our everyday schedule, at least I don't. Uh, I try to avoid them, they, but rather they just happen to us. We fall into them, or better yet, and I, I like this, they fall in and all around us. That's what trials do. This word peripacete, encounter, uh, it's the same word used in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan, when he encountered uh, uh, robbers. Well, he didn't really encounter them. They fell on him. They fell on and around him. He was on that that journey from Jerusalem down to Jericho, the the famous uh, ascent of Adamim, the ascent of blood, where there would be all these ne'er-do-wells waiting to jump out and take advantage of unsuspecting travelers. And, and, and that word uh, means that they fell upon him. So this word encounter, count it all joy when you encounter, when these trials fall around you. Uh, and then the, he says these various trials, literally that word various, uh, poikoloi, is a word that means multicolored. It could be marital trials, financial trials, health trials, family trials, relational trials, vocational trials. Now, Most people stop right there with that phrase, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. But James is not done yet. He goes on to tell us why we should uh, consider it all joy. He tells us why we should do this. And the reason why, even in the midst of various trials, the reason we can count it all joy is that there is something that we know that other people don't know. Consider it all joy. Now watch this, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing. You know something. And what we know is this. It's that the thing that enables us to rejoice in the midst of various sundry trials of life, look at verse 3, is this, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, you just circle that word endurance. That's the Greek word hupomone. Uh, Hupo means under. Uh, Meno means to stay, to stay under, to bear up under, in other words, or to bear through a trial. Uh, testing of your faith produces hupomone. It produces the ability to bear up or endure uh, trials. And then he says, let endurance then have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, this is a biblical truth that is not exactly Uh, real popular, to be quite honest. But we must embrace it nevertheless. We must learn it 
and it's this. One way God uses to ultimately grow you and me, one way God uses to ultimately mature us in the Christian life is to uh, have us experience trials. In other words, to have us go through a period of, of suffering. I mean, it's no pain, no gain in the Christian life. Now, of course, we must say that God has other ways to mature us. Certainly, yes, he does. It's not just suffering, but suffering uh, it, it seems to be a common theme uh, when it comes to maturity. Uh, but it seems to me that trials are an integral part of that formula that God uses again and again and again to bring us to a deeper level of maturity in the Christian life. Now, I wish that weren't the case, but most of us understand that the greatest times of growth and maturity spiritually in our lives have been in times where we're going through a difficult trial. And that is exactly why James can say here, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, because you know that God is doing something, something amazing in your life during this period of difficulty. James says God is producing endurance. He's producing hupomone in us, endurance, and, and it has the result that we will be mature and whole, lacking uh, in nothing. Now, the very next verse, James chapter 1, verse 5, i got to say something about this. It's an interesting verse, very, very familiar to all of us. At, at first glance, it seems to be rather random, but notice what it says. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. This is another verse, really, that is often taken out of context. The context of this verse is what? It's to, it's to ask for wisdom during those times when you and I are experiencing the trials of life. Now, you can always ask God for wisdom, but this is a specific smart bomb in the midst of a trial. What we ought to be doing is crying out to God for wisdom, and this makes so much sense. Most of us, when we're going through a trial, we go to God and say, God, I, I don't know what you're doing. What's going on? What's up with this? How do I handle this? He says, but if any of you lack wisdom, if you lack, you know, Sophia, skill to live life skillfully, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach. And so James is talking here about how you and I are to handle the trials of life. We're to ask God for wisdom uh, so, so that we might understand and, and know how to endure this trial successfully. Now, I want you to notice something. James then goes on down in verse 12 to say, he's still talking about trials here, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Now, notice that word blessed there. We've already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but this word blessed, does it ring a bell to you? It ought to. Where did James get this word blessed? Uh, uh, makarios, which means to be happy. Uh, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Does it sound familiar at all? It, it ought to. It, it should. It, it sounds like to me the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, the greatest sermon Jesus ever preached. Remember, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are mourned. Happy, 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 blessed, blessed, eight times. And James says here in chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised uh, to those who love him. So very much paralleling, I believe, his, his half-brother's greatest sermon. No doubt James heard that sermon uh, more than once, and it greatly impacted uh, his life. And so many times we see these uh, parallel passages in James that remind us very uh, distinctly of the Sermon on the Mount. And so James starts off in chapter 1, verses 2 through 12, talking about the trials of life. And then in verse 13, he shifts gears and he starts talking about not trials, but temptations, the temptations of life. And it's interesting, it's the exact same word, the word for trials and the word for temptations, the same exact Greek word, parasmos, a testing, a proving ground, an experiment 
to help you build up your endurance, your hupomone. And so, but what a very practical start to this book, Trials, Temptations. Everybody has trials. Everybody has temptations. And first, James deals with trials, those things that are external. They're on the outside. They're things that fall in on us and around us. And then he shifts his focus and goes right to the temptations of life that we face. These happen to be the struggles that we face that take place down on the inside of us. Trials are external. Temptations are internal. Same word, parasmos. It just, you know, you interpret it either trials or temptation, uh, depending on the context. Um, Let's see here. Uh, In verses 16 and 17, Most people miss this of chapter 1. James gives us the antidote for temptation, and we should all think about these verses the next time we are tempted uh, to do something that's outside of God's will. He says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Let me say it again. Every good thing given and every perfect gift comes from above. Uh, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting in, uh, in shadow. Uh, so the, the anecdote, did you catch it? Whenever we face a temptation in life, and a, and a lot of these temptations originate from our own flesh, certainly, our sin nature. Other times a temptation may come from a demonic spirit or, 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 or some other source. But when it comes to temptation, uh, when we're, when we're tempted, basically, we're being tempted to do something or to meet a need in a way other than the way by what God, what, what God has already uh, uh, appropriated or appointed for us. And so, in essence, in a temptation, if we give into it, we're in essence saying, God, you really aren't meeting this need in my life. I, I'm going to have to go out and meet this in my own way. And, uh, uh, and that is contrary to your will, Lord, for my life, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buckle under this temptation. It's the same old lie from the garden, certainly. You know, has God said, thou shalt not eat from any tree in the garden? God knows and the day you eat of it, you'll know good and evil. You know, God's holding back on you. There's something you know that he knows and you can know. And if you'll just eat this fruit, you can have all this. You'll be like God. God's not giving you what you need. And so what James is saying here is that the first thing that you and I need to, to remember when we are tempted is to Uh, look back and recall that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting of shadow. In other words, don't be deceived by this shiny trinket, this temptation that you're being tempted with, but rather think about the good gifts that God has already given you. Uh, Whatever area you're being tempted in, take inventory of that area of your life and and think about what provision God has already made for you there to meet this need. And that's the antidote to uh, temptation for all of us uh, in life. We we go on over to chapter 2. Chapter 2 breaks really nicely into into two equal halves, uh, 13 verses each, chapter 1 through 13 on favoritism, chapter 14 through Uh, The end of the chapter is on faith. If we talk about this idea of favoritism, number one, uh, that familiar passage, notice chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers and sisters, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Um, And uh, again, this is very reminiscent of Jesus. It's almost like it's one of his parables that that James now breaks into here. The Greek here is very graphic, very vivid. He says, for a man comes into your assembly uh, with a gold ring and and he is dressed in bright clothes and a poor man comes in in dirty clothes. And so you have these two men coming into the church and one of them is poor. He's dressed, the Bible says, in rags, uh, literally dirty clothes. It's the Greek word rupara, means greasy or he's like pig pen. He's soiling everything he touches. He's repulsive. In fact, that's where we get our English word, repulsive, from this word for rags or dirty clothes, the Greek word rupara. And the other man is rich, it says. He is, he, and we know he's rich because he's got a gold ring on. That, that, that word for gold ring, uh, crusodactylius, 
Uh, it really literally means gold fingered. He's got a ring, a gold ring on every single one of his fingers. He is a rich man. He's dressed, it says, in bright clothing. And of course, the church uh, seats this man in the most prominent seat in the entire auditorium. And then it says this poor man. Uh, I love this, the, this word poor man here. Uh, it's the Greek word tokos, tokos with a P, patokos. And it's one of these onomatopoeias. It's a word that sounds like something, like spitting. And uh, it means literally crouching or cowering or slinking. And so this poor man just slinks in, crouching into the, into the church. And James says, you know, you, you have him stand over there or take a seat at your footstool. And James says it's sinful to show favoritism like that. And he talks about this, this word favoritism, an interesting Greek word. It, it's a word that has the idea of looking at the face. Literally, it means an acceptor of a face, a respecter of persons, in other words. It's, it's someone's appearance or it's someone's money or someone's clothing or influence or position. This is the reason we hold them in high esteem. But this passage clearly teaches that favoritism is a sin. We should accept every person as someone made uh, in God's image. Uh, now, the second half of James 2, this is where we find this most famous, or rather maybe even better to say most infamous, controversial section in the entire book. You're probably familiar with it, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, where James develops this whole issue of faith and works. You know, James teaches, it's the whole argument, you know, James teaches uh, faith plus works equals salvation, whereas the Apostle Paul in his 13 epistles teaches salvation by grace alone through faith alone equals salvation. So faith without works uh, is all that's needed. And so I think what's going on here, you've got this, you know, uh, battle between the Apostle Paul and James that many want to try to uh, brew up here. But I think what's going on, the best way to understand this is, is that whenever Paul would write to the Gentiles, he would always emphasize the need for the Gentiles to <clears throat> place their faith in the Lord. You know, they were coming out of a pagan religious context, but James is not writing to Gentiles. James is writing to Jewish believers who were coming out of a system that was steeped in doing good works uh, the law and, and all of that, doing good works in order to be justified. And these Jews, they needed to be convinced that they didn't need to do all these good works in order to be in, in right standing with God. And of course, we can just imagine that as they were taught this, a lot of these Jewish converts would most likely be prone to uh, having come out of this Pharisaic you know, system of religious works uh, and having gotten over that brainwashing to now hear the truth of the gospel uh, how to, to do all these good works is not needed anymore. They, they, they basically swing the pendulum back the other way uh, to the extreme. Once you break free from that old system of law, what's so often the case is to go to the other extreme, and that's what they did. And they just said, listen, man, we're done with all this whole work system uh, situation, and now works are completely optional even after you become a believer. That was kind of the mindset that had begun to, to, to develop there. And so James is telling them, look, you, you don't have to do good works in order to be saved, but works are an evidence that your faith is real. Uh, chapter 2, verse 14, notice what it says. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith? Now, I want you to notice here, uh, it doesn't say that the person has faith. It just says that he says he has faith. What use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, uh, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And this is a classic Hebrewism here. Uh, the use of the rhetorical question here in James 2, 14, and the answer is that James is insinuating here is no. That, that faith can't save him because that's no faith at all because there's nothing to back it up. He's just saying he has faith when in reality he has no faith because there are no evidentiary works associated with him. A faith that has no works is a dead faith. It's not a real faith. Now, the confusion comes in at the end of this section where James says twice that a man is justified by works. 
Notice verse 24 of chapter 2. You see, that person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so people say, well, hold on, hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Paul, in his writings, Paul, the greatest theologian who ever lived, Paul says you're justified by faith alone without works. And James, you know, old camel knees, James the just here, the least theological book in the New Testament, is saying, you're, you know, he says faith plus works equals salvation. And so you can see why, uh, you know, people like Martin Luther fought so strongly against uh, against this book as he had been fighting against the Catholicism of his day, Roman Catholicism, and its merit-based, works-based salvation. You can see why Luther said that James was this right straw epistle, and he listed James actually in, uh, at the end of his New Testament canon. He just puts it there kind of as an afterthought. But we must understand here uh, the, the key to this to me is that the word justified or the word justification, it really has two meanings. Uh, one meaning is to be declared righteous. That's the judicial, uh, forensic, legal sense of the word uh, justification, just to be declared righteous uh, by divine verdict. That's, how the way, that's the way Paul uses the word in his writing, to be declared righteous before God by faith. That's what justification is to Paul. But the other flip side of the meaning of justified has the idea of being vindicated or to, or to be proven or to be shown that we are true or that, that we have saving faith. And this is the way that James employs the word. And so, yes, we're, we're justified before God. We are declared righteous before him forensically, legally, on the basis of faith and faith alone, period, paragraph, sola fide. But we're vindicated, we're proven or demonstrated or shown to be believers among people by our works. And so there's a difference there. Both are true. Uh, just two different senses of the word justification. So humanly speaking, when you think about it, you know, a person can tell another person, I have faith, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. But the problem is, you know, faith is a phantom. You can't really see it. It's not a, a physical thing, certainly. It's not a material thing. The only way faith can be visibly seen is by what it produces in someone's life, the tangible outworkings in a person's behavior and in their life, that's the evidence of our faith. It's, it's works. The way that other people can recognize our faith is, is just simply by our works. We're saved by faith alone and justified by faith alone before God, yes, but we're vindicated, proven, and shown to have faith before others by the works that we do. Hope that makes sense to you. So, Let's put this inner Nicene warfare between Paul and James. Let's put that to rest. James and Paul are not at odds with one another. Paul is talking about justification in the forensic legal sense of the word, being declared righteous before God. And James is using the word justified in the sense of being vindicated or proven or shown uh, to be uh, uh, saved and to have faith, saving faith in Christ. And in the book of James, the idea uh, is uh, clearly brought out here. Well, let's skip over. You know, chapter 3 is uh, all about teachers. You know, let not many of you, my brethren, become teachers because you incur stricter judgment. Um, and then chapter 4 is all about strife, uh, you know, uh, and humility. You know, what is the source of quarrels? Chapter 4, verse 1, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the source not your pleasures? That's the word for hedonism, your desires. Uh, so that's chapter 3, chapter 4. It gets us to chapter 5, and I want to go into this one passage about calling on the elders, you know, where, where it says, hey, you know, call on the elders and, uh, and have them come and anoint you with oil. This is in chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, probably one of the most interesting uh, passages in all of James. I and I just want to explain to you real quick what I think is going on here in this passage. First of all, this is a very difficult passage, very thorny passage to be sure. And really the key word here in this passage is the word prayer. It's used seven times in eight verses. But here it is. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him 
anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, kind of an interesting passage, certainly. And what I believe James is saying here is, It is possible that some believers within the congregation, they may be ill, they may be stricken with illness, rather, physically by God because of some specific sin. I think that's what he's talking about here. They've got some particular sin in their life, and because of that sin, they are stricken with illness. And let me just be clear here. I'm not saying that all illness is because of sin. That's not the case at all. Uh, uh, However... Some sickness is uh, caused by sin. In fact, really, I guess all sin is caused by sin in one sense. We're we're fallen people. But most of the sickness we have is not caused by sin. Uh, We just happen to live in a fallen world. There's viruses, germs, cancer. Our bodies are weak and frail and susceptible to all kinds of illness and disease. I got that. But I think what James is talking about here specifically is that this case, in this case, these people... There are particular people within this congregation who are sick and who are having physical problems, and it's all because of some sin. And the reason why I think this is because James says, listen, you call the elders, and you have them come and anoint you with oil, and the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. And one of the reasons I take this to be referring to someone under discipline from God is because after this, he immediately goes into this illustration of Elijah. And Elijah, he says, was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And why didn't it rain for three years and six months? Well, it's because of, of sin, sin in the land, the sin of King Ahab. And it was God's discipline that brought this uh, to bear. And then Elijah goes and he prays, and the discipline is lifted. And I think that's the parallel to what uh, James is talking about here in James chapter 5. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And so based on all this, just that was just a kind of a quick synopsis, but I believe what James is saying here is that there can be a time in the life of a person, and this may very well be going all the way back to chapters 3 and 4 that I skipped over where James has talked all about conflict in the church. Some people in the church, because of that conflict, may have been been stricken with some sort of physical illness due to their uh, bad behavior and, and because of the strife they were causing there. And now uh, James is telling, he's saying, listen, if you've, if you've got this sickness you, and you think it's caused by sin in your life, just call the elders. They'll come lay hands on you. And when they do, and they pray for you, anointing you, you'll get well. And the reason why is that discipline will be lifted because you've confessed uh, your sin before the Lord. There's a lot more I could say about this, but notice the last two verses of James 5, I think really kind of support this. Uh, Look at verses 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, Let him know that that one who has turned a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death. In other words, the ultimate outcome could be that you you would die physically if you didn't repent, Uh, but but this prayer of faith will cover a multitude of sin. Uh, And so just like that, the book of James comes to an abrupt end. It started abruptly and just bang, bang, bang. Uh, The author, the audience, the first subject... And then it just cuts off here uh, in verse 20 of James chapter 5, somewhat of a dramatic, abrupt, uh, challenging ending to this book, to say the least. But that's James's style. He ends this letter here, this first New Testament book uh, to be written. And, you know, again, as I think back on the book of James, the great practical truth 
uh, uh, that it contains, the trials of life, the temptations that come into our life, how we welcome God's word into our life, what true religion looks like, favoritism, faith and works, the teachers, the tongue, strife and self-sufficiency, humility, riches, patience, prayer, so much here uh, uh, to, to, to dig deep with and to dig deep on. So James is, is all about a faith that works. It's both and to be justified on the basis of, of evidentiary uh, works in your life to show that you truly are born again. Uh, that's what James is all about. Uh, that a believer is to be one who is practicing what they believe, and you ought to see the works in his or her life. Well, let me wrap this up. I'll close this in prayer, but that's the book of James, the very first book of the New Testament to be written. Uh, I hope you'll be back with us next week. We'll be back in the New Testament plowing through some more of these general epistles. It'll be First and Second Peter, if I'm not mistaken. So please make plans to join us as we uh, are, are just zeroing in on that final last uh, capstone book, the book of Revelation uh, here in the New Testament. Let's pray together and we'll, we'll close. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful book, this short five chapter, 108 verses, so practical, so clear, so concise. Uh, we love this character, James. What an amazing uh, saint he was from the first century, the first Christian pastor at the first Christian church. Uh, what an amazing resume he has. Uh, Lord, as he writes, he he has his own unique style, yes, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was the half-brother of our Lord. And so, Father, help us to grasp the teaching of this book. Help us to apply it uh, to our life. This book lays out for us how we might live the kind of life that you would have us to live, a life of faith that is evidenced by the works uh, that are seen uh, day to day in our life. So make us uh, people that uh, where our uh, belief behaves, our faith is, is, uh, it has legs, it has works, um, and we uh, commit this study to you, ask your blessing upon it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, guys, we'll see you next week as we open up the book of First and Second Peter together. God bless you. Uh, stay faithful.